All right. Sorry about that. I was having some uh, audio uh, issues there, but uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, on this webinar on Spotted Lanternfly. Uh, my name is Peter Vu. I am the brand manager uh, for Rainbow. Uh, today, I am joined via webinar by Emily Swackhammer with Penn State Extension and Shannon Herbst with Rainbow. Uh, before we begin, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar is worth one uh, ISA CEU. Uh, if you did not enter uh, or are not sure if you entered your ISA certification number uh, in during the registration period, uh, you can type that into the chat slash questions box right now and uh, we'll uh, make sure that you get your CEU for attending. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentations, uh, feel free to type those uh, into the same chat slash questions box and uh, with whatever time we have left available after the presentations, uh, we'll try to answer uh, as many of those as we can. Uh, so we're going to hold off on answering any questions until uh, the very end here. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available uh, afterwards. Uh, we'll send out an email uh, so that you can view it. All right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Emily uh, Swankhammer. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am here to talk about Spotted Lanternfly, and I'm a county extension educator in Montgomery County with Penn State Extension. And I've been in the middle of the Spotted Lanternfly invasion since the beginning. So um, I'm going to try to get uh, those of you that might not be familiar with this insect kind of caught up with its biology and identification, and also include the new things that we learned in 2017 about the spotted lanternfly. When you see um, news reports about the spotted lanternfly, you often see this image at the upper left where its wings are spread. And that is um, what it looks like when, you, when it displays its bottom wings. But usually, it doesn't look like that. You only see the red under wings when it's startled or when it's flying. But in nature at rest, they usually look like the other pictures on this slide. Um, with their wings down over their backs. It was discovered in Berks County in September of 2014, and es experts estimated that it er had arrived in Pennsylvania during about 2012, based on old weathered egg masses that they found on the site. It's native to parts of Asia, China, uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, but it uh, was also recently introduced into South Korea. And we're learning a lot from the South Korean literature, how it uh, reacted in that country. The climate of South Korea is very similar to Pennsylvania. And also, the size of South Korea is very similar to the size of Pennsylvania. So in South Korea, they didn't really react to it. And the insect spread across South Korea in about three years' time. And it became a major pest of some of their agricultural crops, um, in particular, grapes and stone fruit. In Pennsylvania, we've had kind of an all-out effort with everybody, the public and the professionals um, alike, to try to fight the lanternfly and stop the spread. And it's spread, yes, but it hasn't uh, completely spread across the whole state yet. So we think that really is um, in uh, attributed to the efforts of uh, all these different people. Um, I have a picture there of a spotted lanternfly sitting on, on my hand, and that's just to remind me to tell you that the lanternfly does not bite people, and that's something that a lot of people ask questions about. So um, no, they don't bite people. This picture shows one of the young life stages of spotted lanternfly, and it's on status, which is a flower plant in my garden. Um, the lanternfly has a really wide host range, and especially when it's very young, it seems to feed on just about every, any plant that is available. So sometimes you'll find them on herbaceous plants like status, also daylilies, cucumbers, or basil, and others. But on the, the uh, left side of the slide here, I've tried to categorize some of the woody plants that we're very concerned about. Certainly the fruit crops, and this year we saw it in grape and apple. I have some pictures to show you. 
Um, then the next line represents the timber trees and also important ornamentals in landscapes, maples, birch, sycamore, and others. The third line represents some very important native plants that Leonard Fly really likes, willow and staghorn sumac, and then there just are many others that are, we'll feed on. At the bottom there, I have preferred hosts, and we know that the lantern fly really especially loves the tree of heaven or Alanthus altissima, and also it really loves black walnut and hops. So this um, preferred host category comes from host range studies that the researchers have been doing where they'll put cloth bags like cages on the branches of different trees. They'll introduce the very early first nymphal stage into the bag and try to raise them through exclusively on these hosts. And in 2017, the researchers were able to get them all the way through their life cycle in Pennsylvania on those three hosts, the tree of heaven, black walnut, and hops. We also know that they um, can complete their their life cycle to adulthood on China berry, which is an invasive tree in the southern part of the United States. So um, through their behavior, though, we know that they, they really like Alanthus, and they seem to want to feed on Alanthus at some point in their life cycle. We're trying to use that fact as a weapon against them in one of our management strategies, um, setting up Alanthus altissima as trap trees, and I'll be discussing that a little later. Here are the national rankings of some threatened Pennsylvania commodities. We're the number one um, exporter of hardwoods in the U.S., and that industry is in the billions of dollars of magnitude every year. Apples and peaches were the fourth largest producer. Grapes were the fifth largest producer. So there's a lot of concern um, because this insect has the ability to affect so many different commodities. This is a picture showing the detection survey that the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has been doing. And the red dots represent where they have found the spotted lanternfly. Um, we now know that it is also in Virginia in a small area, but it is an established population. The green dots on this represent where the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has been looking for the lanternfly and they have not found it. A lot of these dots, the green dots, represent vineyards. Um, PDA is going to vineyards because that's often a place that you will find them. So we know that it's not uniformly distributed and there is a quarantine um, in place that encompasses 13 counties in the southeastern part of the state. But the lanternfly is not uniformly distributed across that area and I'll be talking about that in relation to the quarantine requirements. Um, so if anybody finds the lanternfly outside of this area that is known to be infested, we're really hoping that they will report it in Pennsylvania to the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture or in any other states to their respective departments of agriculture. This is the map from the very early um, part of the infestation. In the fall of 2014, two townships in the very eastern corner of Berks County were known to be infested and were immediately placed under quarantine by the Department of Agriculture. And very quickly afterward, they added um, the other areas, the other townships and boroughs in the red shading to this area. So we started out with five townships under quarantine in the fall of 2014. That area spread to, it was something like 75 municipalities under quarantine as of September 22nd of 2017. And this was just really starting to get unwieldy. Um, some people were confused because there might, there are townships with the same name in multiple counties. And sometimes people don't know what township they live in. And it was just getting to be really hard for businesses as well to operate around this continually changing uh, quarantine area. So in the fall of 2017, the Department of Agriculture went to a bi-county quarantine situation. And this shows the 13 counties that are currently under quarantine. But remember from the, um, from the map I showed you with the red dots, the get my pointer here. The um, infestation is much 
it's heaviest in this area, so it's not uniformly distributed throughout this, the peripheral counties. Well, what does the quarantine mean? In a nutshell, it means no one may intentionally move viable life stages of the spotted lanternfly. Um, that includes the eggs, viable eggs. So it's important for everybody to know what the viable life stages look like. The quarantine is enacted and regulated by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And you just have to start thinking about any outdoor items. So it could be, um, you know, the concerns are that we don't want people to move nymphs or adults, and certainly not females that have potential to lay eggs. But um, the other real danger is moving the egg masses. And I'll show you how they have the ability to lay their eggs on just about any outdoor item. So crated materials, vehicles, equipment. I've seen egg masses on rusty metal of equipment, like um, on the blade of a snowplow, um, trailers, recreational vehicles, hard goods such as stone tile, decorative materials, firewood is a big concern, nursery stock, and this list goes on and on. They really aren't uh, too choosy about what they will lay their eggs on. Um, they'll even lay their eggs on plastic things like um, little tykes type of play sets for children. Um, they're, they, they really are not that selective and will lay their eggs on just about anything. So to be in compliance with the quarantine, this affects everybody. Residents um, must inspect items and make sure that they're not transporting vi um, mobile life stages or viable eggs. And then there is a checklist provided from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture that they can um, sign and take with any item that they need to transport after they've inspected it. And you know they're verifying that it is free of spotted lanternfly. And residents can use this as a legal document that keeps them in compliance with the quarantine. Businesses is a slightly different situation. Um, I, I think the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is really trying to um, get people to use the very best common sense. They, there is an enforcement um, possibility. If someone violates this quarantine, they can levy fines. To my knowledge, nobody has been fined yet, and PDA really doesn't want to do that. But they're encouraging all businesses to come to an agreement with the PDA um, that gives them some assurance that you're trying to be careful. So they had been doing compliance agreements, and that was a many-page legal document that, you know, basically um, you were signing and attesting to the fact that you were aware of the problem, and you would do all in your power to not spread the land and fly each compliance agreement was good for one calendar year. That was for taking items from within the quarantine area to outside of the quarantine area. But because of this concern about the potential to even spread it within the quarantine area, the PDA is switching to a permit system that will apply really to everybody. So um, this permit, you as businesses, you would need to be trained and then you get some sort of a hang tag for your truck or, or you could put it on your dashboard. Um, and that is a visual way that our PDA inspectors know that you've been through the spotted lantern fly training and that you're one of the businesses that has a permit. If anybody from our Southeast PA area is listening, there is a permit training happening on Thursday, March 22nd at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Montgomery County 4-H Center in Creamery. Um, they still have space for people. If you have questions about that, you could give me a call. I'm at the Montgomery County Extension Office at 610-489-4315. I'd love to get more people in that training that's happening on Thursday. So if you're looking for spotted lanternfly, you really want to focus on areas near the tree of heaven. And part of um, helping everybody be aware of this problem is also teaching people to identify the tree of heaven. Uh, I don't have time to go into that today, but you know, it's a compound leaf tree. It's often confused with walnut and staghorn sumac. Um, and identifying the tree also will help you if you want to start setting up the trap trees you know, you know, help you get to the first step of that. So this is a picture of an adult spotted lanternfly, and you can see the mouth parts there. They are big plant hoppers. 
they have piercing sucking mouth parts and it's almost like a straw that they'll insert into the plant material to feed on the sap. When they do that, they ingest a lot of sap and then they excrete some of it as honeydew, um, which is partially digested tree sap that has a lot of sugar content left in it. And there are fungi that will grow on the honeydew. Um, collectively, we call that sooty mold that will accumulate under um, groups of these insects. So this is a picture of what results, and this is from a residential landscape. This is an Alanthus altissima tree that's been fed upon by a tremendous population of lanternfly adults. They are piercing through the um, mature bark and you can see just from the wounding action, sap is flowing out of these wounds. But they're also excreting honeydew and the sooty mold is accumulating on the ground below. And this, these areas develop a really uh, kind of sour and funky smell. So it's objectionable in residential landscapes. Here is a picture of an adult lanternfly that's excreting honeydew and there's a yellow jacket uh, collecting the honeydew. So um, yellow jackets like to collect sweet substances. If you've ever been at a picnic in the fall and yellow jackets will be buzzing around uh, cans of soda, that's the same kind of desire to collect the sweet um, substance. Uh, this is another objectionable feature in residential landscapes. Um, people are afraid of stinging insects. Some people are highly allergic to them. So not a good thing and definitely a nuisance. This is a picture um, from a family that had a river birch over a, a deck and staircase made of recycled plastic lumber. And you can see it was a light colored lumber and the lanternflies um, excreted the honeydew and the sooty mold accumulated. The bottom step there has been pressure washed, but you can still see the pattern of where that family, you know, had moved the wand. So you, it's really hard to get it, you know, really clean. And also these uh, steps can be slippery. So it can be a um, safety hazard. This is a picture showing um, lanternflies adult lanternflies and in the fall of it was the, it was a oh, it was September of 2017 so late summer into the fall they um, the adults took to flight and we found out that they fly a whole lot better than we had originally thought so they seem to like to go to warm sides of buildings tall objects um, also they flew you know into certain tree species and in this case, they all flew to the side of this house and there's nothing for them to feed on there. So they would die. And this homeowner was vacuuming up the lantern flies um, so they didn't have all these piles of dead insects. This is a concern because it's definitely a nuisance. It's not what you want, you know, swarming around your patio at that time of year. Um, but we have also had some unscrupulous uh, businesses coming through the area doing high pressure sales, trying to tell people, you know, that they had to buy pest management practices um, to prevent the adults from getting into their walls and feeding on the wood of their houses. And it's just not true. So the adult spotted lanternfly does not feed on um, the wood of structures. It's not trying to get into the wall space to overwinter because they will die with the cold temperatures. They don't overwinter as adults. They only overwinter as eggs. So this is a new picture from 2017. Um, our graduate student, Erica at Penn State, caught these pictures at one of our Berks County orchards. And this was the same time of year, that early September timeframe when the adults all decided to take to flight. And in this case, they swarmed into this apple orchard. They're feeding on the woody parts of the tree. Um, they will not feed on the fruit of the apple, um, but they're extracting sap from this tree and there's a lot of concern about how this will affect the long-term health of that tree. They're also excreting honeydew and sooty mold can accumulate on the fruit. So it's a fruit quality concern. And um, and the, the orchardists can come through and spray insecticides. So um, in Pennsylvania, the laws are um, that you have to, you can only use a pesticide that is labeled for the site that you want to use it on. So in this case, you could use an insecticide that is labeled for fruit trees. Um, 
the orchardist did that. He killed a lot of lanternflies. And then the next day, more lanternflies from the surrounding area took to flight and swarmed back into this orchard. So the uh, producers are running into problems with um, intervals at which pesticides are allowed based on label directions, and also um, days to harvest intervals. So it's um, possible to kill them with insecticides. It's legal to kill them with insecticides, but if the label doesn't um, allow you to spray more frequently than you need to, you can still suffer damage from this. And this orchardist did tally up uh, a pretty big economic figure of damage that he um, suffered from this pest. In the same orchard, he also had some grapes and the lanternflies did a very similar behavior uh, flocking to these grapes at that same early September time of year. So the quality of the wine that would um, result from this could definitely be affected. Um, just the sweetness of the apples in the previous picture because so much of the sugar is being diverted into the bodies of the insects. In 2017, we also became concerned about some of our, our forage crops. Um, some of the farms had a lot of lanternflies, especially in the edges of their fields. And there, there are some reports that lanternflies may have um, unwholesome compounds in their bodies that would be really bad for especially horses to eat. So the University of Pennsylvania is doing some work on this this summer. At the moment, we have kind of mixed results. We're not sure if this is a, a valid concern or not, but um, the uh, even the crop farmers are watching this insect very closely. They don't want to have it be a health hazard to the livestock that would eat their crops. People are asking about the long-term health of the trees, and um, we're starting to see death of trees in Tree of Heaven. And that's what this picture shows. So this is a, a grove of Tree of Heaven that are probably 12 years old or so. And there's been a tremendous population of lanternflies feeding on these trees for two years. And then in the third year, 2017, we started to see trees dying. Now, in most cases, I was seeing some secondary invaders, um, borers, some kind of uh, root rot types of organisms, and um, what the final nail in the coffin was, I'm not really sure, but we're definitely seeing death of Alanthus trees, and we're wondering um, for 2018 how the landscape trees that were really heavily infested will leaf out and how vigorous they will be when that happens this spring. In 2017, we also saw them really uh, swarming on walnuts. And this is a walnut seedling. And you see in the center of the field there, it's um, loaded with the nymphs of lanternfly. And they're feeding and excreting honeydew, which is falling down on the leaves below. Just next to this walnut seedling was this one. And here the, the cluster of lanternflies is starting to um, disperse because they have drained this tree to the point where it's defoliated. And I took this picture on August 6th, which is really too early for a walnut seedling to be defoliating. So this is a heavily stressed seedling. We're going to wait and see what happens again when it leaves out in the spring. Here are some black walnuts that are growing along a stream bank, and you can see the dieback there in the upper part of the tree, and that was the result of these clusters of nymphs feeding in high, high numbers on black walnut last year. We saw the same kind of damage on willow, and here it is on staghorn sumac. So I wanted to show you pictures of all the life stages so everybody can identify it. This is a picture of wild grape. And when the lanternfly hatches from the eggs, they are black with white spots. They go through three stages that are black with white spots. So the first three instars are the, uh, look that way. And then the fourth nymphal stage, or the fourth instar, is um, black with white spots, but it has this red coloration as well. And they really are striking and, and beautiful insects. 
Um, this is an Alanthus altissima that had a high population of, thir of fourth instars with the red coloration. And I could see that this tree looked red from about 50 feet away and went over and looked and there were thousands of lanternfly on it. And then I captured this picture just in that transition time between uh, within, when they were in the fourth instar stage and they were starting to become adults. So they don't spin cocoons or pupate or anything like that. Um, they go just from that fourth instar stage um, and then the exoskeleton will crack open and the adult will crawl out. When the adult first crawls out, it's very light in color, but it dries down to this kind of mauve coloration pretty quickly. So this picture was taken in um, the second week of August. And then these are the kind of populations we're seeing. This is a cluster of Alanthus altissima trees, but we're seeing populations like this on all these other landscape trees as well. The females will mate and they begin to lay eggs by the beginning of September. And here the female has laid eggs on a tree and she's laid them in rows. The eggs almost look like little jelly beans um, lined up end to end. I have a, another picture to show you that a little better. But when she's done making her egg mass, she'll coat it with a secretion from her body to protect the eggs. When it first comes out, it's white and wet, and then it will dry down to a darker color. Each female can lay up to two egg, egg masses, um, and we're not sure that they don't have the capacity to lay three. That's a possibility. Um, and each egg mass has between 30 and 50 egg masses on average, or eggs on average. So I took this picture of an egg mass um, in November, and you can see the covering, covering the egg mass. And quite often, you'll notice where a female has kind of missed some of the eggs, and we don't know why, if she got disturbed, but that's something you know to, to look for to try to identify the eggs. So the ones that are uncovered there, you can see look like little jelly beans lined up kind of end to end. I went back and took a picture of that same egg mass in March, and I wanted uh, pictures of this to show people how the appearance of the egg masses can change um, through that winter season. So um, this time of year, this is what these eggs would look like. And they're, the covering's very dried down um, and has these deep cracks developed in it. The females will lay their eggs on virtually anything, any solid objects. Um, so here is a railroad tie that uh, we, we flipped it over so the females went underneath it where it was protected and laid egg masses. And you can see they almost look like a splooch of mud on that railroad tie. There were egg masses on the cinder blocks and also on the fence posts in the same area. So this debris was underneath a grove of Alanthus trees that were heavily infested. And the danger is that somebody you know, with good intentions maybe wants to clean this area up, loads everything onto a truck and transports them. So that's, um, that's a big concern. <clears throat> this is a picture of a bench that was underneath a willow tree that had a high infestation. And again, you can see these, um, these egg masses that almost look like splooches of mud on the underside of this bench. Firewood is a big concern. So we're, we're trying to come up with best management practices um, for firewood and really other commodities. Um, what I'm telling people is, burn firewood locally. Don't move firewood if you don't have to. And if you do wind up moving firewood, make sure you're in compliance with the quarantine requirements. You have your, you know, your checklist filled out. If you're a professional, make sure you're um, in compliance with the PDA. And it's very best to burn all of the firewood that season. So you're not keeping firewood that potentially could have egg masses on it, you know, through the next summer. So those are just some, some things you can do. Oh, another thing is to not store your firewood under heavily infested trees. So um, some of our firewood producers are storing their stockpiles out in the middle of fields, far, as far away from trees as they can. This is a rock under an Alanthus grove that had a lot of insects. You can see the um, sooty mold that accumulated on the surface of this rock. And when I looked under the rock, I found five egg masses, so one, two, three, four, five. 
and this is a very protected area so we don't really have any hope that very cold temperatures are going to eradicate spotted lanternfly for us. This is a picture from earlier this month that I took in the Maxitawney Township area of Berks County. Um, it's a birch tree and the, um, the lanternflies just really loved this tree. We don't know why um, they were so fond of it, but the females just flocked to it and you can see there's a lot of egg masses there and each one has 30 to 50 eggs. So there will be high populations in some of our, our areas um, in 2018. This is another tree from a similar area in Berks County um, showing the egg masses. These were under, laid underneath a flap of bark on a dead tree and the females for some reason must have found that to be a good protected site and you can almost not tell where the egg masses start and the next one or stop and where the next one starts. So it's just kind of one coalesced gigantic egg mass. So the mantra for spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania right now is containment. We're trying to keep it um, in the area where it exists and not have it get to new areas. We're trying to control it within the area. Um, so if you have the ability to kill spotted lanternfly, we're encouraging people to do that. And then we're still uh, you know, talking about what it would take to eradicate this insect from um, North America. And eradication, if possible, would take years and it would be, um, there would be tools kind of on many fronts. So there's a lot of research going on to try to develop specialized insecticides um, and we'll see where that goes. But the longer we can contain it and keep numbers as under control as possible, the more time we'll give the researchers to work on this eradication effort. In your handouts, I supplied the um, management calendar that we've put together, and um, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but um, I just wanted to point out, we were trying to organize the information based on what time of year it is. And this is very useful, especially with the public who really doesn't always understand, um, you know, the importance of knowing the time of year and how it synchronizes with the life cycle that's down here below. So we're using this as a teaching tool and for the moment the things listed here are what we have as options. Um, this information will continue to evolve as the researchers come up with new management options. But you have that uh, fact sheet in your handouts to look at. And um, I'm, I'm going to talk about some of those management options but before I launch into that I did want to show you pictures of some of the natural controls that we're seeing. Um, it seems the public has this notion that nothing will eat this insect and it, that's uh, you know another thing that's just not true. So here's a picture of a lantern fly that was captured by a spider. We know praying mantids will eat them. This is a wheel bug which is one of the assassin bugs. It's a predator. You see its uh, mouth parts feeding right on the abdomen of this lantern fly. We are seeing some natural predators, but these general predators um, are not creating a big um, dent in the population at the moment. There is some hope though for some more specialized um, biocontrol. This is a tiny wasp that is a parasitoid of spotted lanternfly. Um, you see the measurement bar there. So the whole wasp is only like a millimeter long. It's really tiny and you'd hardly even ever be able to notice it. But this insect, um, the wasp will lay its egg in the eggs of spotted lanternfly. And then when the tiny little wasp hatches out, it devours the contents of the spotted lanternfly egg. It will um, form a cocoon and when it emerges, it can go to attack other lanternfly eggs. So we're hoping that some of these more specialized kind of parasitoids will start developing higher populations and help us in the, um, in the effort. Um, also, some researchers are looking for natural parasites and parasitoids and predators in Asia where the spotted lanternfly came from. Um, to introduce a natural biocontrol though into this country, it's like a 10 year process. We have to be really careful that, um, you know, we're not going to have unintended consequences. So that's another one of these kind of long range 
efforts in management and possible eradication of lanternfly um, for the future. So getting going through some of these control options, you can destroy eggs. And this is a picture where they're scraping the spotted lanternfly egg mass into a plastic baggie. And then when you get all the eggs into the bag, you can add some rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer, and that will kill the eggs. Um, a lot of people are scraping and destroying egg masses. Um, there's actually a feature on the PDA's website where you can report your efforts. Um, and so you'll see the numbers of, of lanternflies that have been killed this way, and it's, it's getting pretty high. It's up over a million and a half. Um, I, when I'm out there, though, in the woods, I often don't have something to scrape with in a plastic bag and rubbing alcohol with me, and you can just smash them. So you can just pick up a stick or a rock and just smash the eggs, and um, when you do that, the liquid comes out from the inside of them, and you know you've killed them. So destroy eggs and avoid moving them around. This is a picture of a practice we're using um, tree banding. So this is like sticky flypaper around trees. The nymphs will fall out of the trees and climb back up the trunks. They do that a lot. And you can catch a lot of nymphs on uh, these sticky bands. So we have some volunteers doing this. People are interested in banding trees on their property using materials that they um, make themselves. But I think it also is something that could be a service that somebody could provide for customers in the area. And here's a picture showing the lanternfly nymphs that are stuck to that sticky band. So it works really well in the younger life stages. Depending on the, the banding material that you're using um, the adult stage, and this is a kind of banding material that isn't super sticky and the adults can walk across it and they actually avoid it. This is where people get really frustrated and they want to, you know, they're trying to help. They want to spray and kill these lanternflies. And um, we don't want people to use dangerous practices. People have used all sorts of um, things that they found in their garage that usually have to do with automotive um, repair work that are not safe for trees and not labeled as insecticides. So we're doing some insecticide evaluation work. Um, in 2017, we did some work, but much more will be happening in 2018. This is a picture of the back of my SUV, and we're loading up to head out into the woods to do some of this evaluation work. Um, here is an Alanthus altissima tree that we built a cage around, and the lanternflies could be in that cage, and then we could come in and spray them with different insecticides and do replicated trials. So from this work, uh, we didn't test everything, um, but we, we did test carbaryl, bifenthrin, and metacloprid as contact sprays, and all of them worked in our studies. We also tested some of the softer insecticides, and of the ones that we tested, neem was the one that gave us variable but the best results against adults. So we really need to find something that we um, can help the homeowners with. So instead of using, um, you know, the automotive chemicals <laughs> that are not safe and not legal, that they can use a licensed pesticide. At the moment, we're suggesting neem as the first thing to try. Um, we are going to be doing more work um, against the other life stages this summer. And there's more researchers working on this project now. So hopefully we're going to have even better information after the 2018 season. We also did some work with systemic insecticides. We looked at dinotefuran and imidacloprid. Um, we were using homeowner available formulations and um, both of these systemic insecticides will kill spotted lanternfly. So there's a variety of products that are available and a variety of um, methods for application. Um, follow the label, make sure everybody's um, reading the directions and, and using them accordingly. So I wanted to mention this trap tree method that the PDA is using as a weapon against lanternfly. In an, an area that has a lot of Alanthus altissima trees, and we know the lanternfly love these trees, um, they're marking and removing about 85% of the trees. They try to remove all of the female trees because the females will produce seed, um, and this is an invasive tree species, which is a problem in its own right. So we're trying to reduce the spread of Alanthus altissima as well. 
So the trees marked with blue are marked for removal. And when you remove these trees, you, you really have to use an herbicide to, um, to really kill them. Um, and it's best to use that herbicide in the fall, in late summer going into the fall. It's most effective at that time of year. And then they're leaving about 15% of the Alanthus altissima trees standing. And in this picture, it's marked with a red X. This tree will be treated with a systemic insecticide. The PDA is using dinotefuran as a trunk spray. And we know that we can kill many, many thousands of lanternflies with one tree using this method. The PDA is only doing this with Alanthus altissima. They are looking for contractors that can um, you know, work with them and, and put this into practice. But in residential landscapes, we know that these systemic insecticides also can protect um, maples and birch and, and other ornamental trees from lanternfly feeding. The lanternflies will keep coming to these trap trees, feeding and dying, and you can kill many, many thousands. Um, this picture shows four days after a soil drench application of dinotefuran, and the insects just kept coming to this tree. So this was really early on in the process. So we're really talking about an integrated pest management approach to spotted lanternfly. Um, just to summarize, we want to avoid moving them around. We want to remove and reduce Alanthus altissima trees um, to remove their preferred host. We can use mechanical methods of scraping eggs and using sticky bands. We want to encourage beneficial insects and just carefully and judiciously using pesticides um, in very targeted ways. So for more information, it's easy to find the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture Spotted Lanternfly website or the Penn State University Spotted Lanternfly website. Um, that's where we're keeping all of the information. We're cross-posting a lot of things. Um, and things will you know, constantly be updating as uh, the season unfolds in 2018. So I think I'm done. All right. Well, thank you, Emily. Uh, and just as a reminder, if you have any questions uh, for Emily, feel free to type those into the uh, question slash chat box. And again, with the time we have left available, uh, we'll try to answer as many of those uh, as we can. Uh, I do want to point out uh, in your control panel, uh, Emily was mentioning this earlier, uh, but uh, in your control panel under the handout section, feel free to download all of those um, um, uh, materials, uh, documents. Um, and I do want to point out that the, uh, the calendar uh, that uh, Emily covered in her presentation there will be available as a uh, PDF. So we'll, we'll send that out afterwards. I know a couple of you had uh, questions around that document. So uh, yes, we will, we will send that out. Um, okay, so now we, we'll uh, go ahead and transition over to Shannon, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, the uh, treatment strategy and treatment options uh, for spotted lantern. Hello, I'm Shannon with Rainbow, and in this part of the webinar, I am going to talk about controls for spotter and lanternfly, which Emily did cover a lot of them. Um, so some of this is going to be a review. Whether this looks like your backyard or your neighbors or some cl some place close to you or within your region, or it's not even in your region at all, there are certain things that you can do currently to help prevent the spread of spot and lanternfly. Unfortunately, this does look like my backyard. I live in Bucks County in Bedminster, and it is one place that the spot and lanternfly is prevalent. So um, as Emily mentioned, uh, determining Alnus altissima and the tree of heaven, um, if it is currently on your property or on your client's property, it's something that can be removed. Uh, it is spread by thousands of seeds per tree and through vegetated sprouting. If you've ever cut um, Alnus, you'll notice that it'll send up dozens of root suckers and re-sprout. So as Emily mentioned, you do need to use a herbicide 
one method of getting rid of the tree of heaven is by doing the hack and squirt. Um, this is where you use a hatchet or similar device and you basically cut a downward angle following label recommendations. Um, you penetrate the bark into the living tissue or the sapwood and produce like a cupping effect to hone the herbicide. We use Sightline, which is triclopyr, um, also known as Garlon. And you spray the measured herbicide quantity into the cuts. It moves up the vascular system, killing the tree. Um, also, when you're removing Alanthus, make sure you're treating the stumps with a herbicide because you will get re-sprouting. The other thing Emily mentioned is the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture does have a scrape it campaign. Um, in late fall, adults will lay egg masses on, as Emily mentioned, a host of trees, smooth surfaces, stones, outdoor furniture, etc. These egg masses are live and viable from October through July. If you're seeing egg mass, you can scrape them off. Um, and currently, if you log on to the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, you can see the number in March 3rd, they had over 1.7 million egg mass scraped. And so it is a definite way to control for spot and lanternfly. Unfortunately, um, it's really difficult to get all the egg mass as Emily showed the stone, you know, underneath the stone and um, a lot of egg mass is hidden as well as not, a lot of homeowners are not able to reach the egg mass because it's so high up in the tree um, or areas that they can't reach from the ground. So another way of controlling spotter and lantern fly is through tree banding. Um, this should be done on six inch diameter trees or larger. It, uh, the, the Department of Agriculture does offer a volunteer banding program and it helps uh, homeowners to know how to place them. They do need to put the sticky side out and it has to be three to five feet off the ground, making sure that the band is tight against the tree. As Emily mentioned, it's not as effective in the later life cycle of the spotted and lantern fly, um, as well as the adults. So tree bands do need to re be replaced every two weeks, and that was something homeowners were not doing as well. They were leaving it on all season. Um, but every two weeks, until the last few weeks of July, they need to be replaced. The other problem with tree bands is that it doesn't just capture spotter and lanternfly, sometimes it can capture other animals as well, like birds, butterflies, pollinators, and just to make sure your clients are aware um, of those things. So Emily did mention the native predators, spiders, uh, capture, they like to eat spotter and lanternfly if they can catch them in their web, praying mantis eat them, even yellow jackets, but they like to feed on dead spotter and lanternfly. Unfortunately, as Emily mentioned, the number of lanternflies are too overwhelming for those predators to have a significant impact. So now we're going to look at chemical controls with TransTech. This is a systemic the applied pesticide. It is Dinotefron. We're going to talk more about what TransTech is, the applications, advantages of using labels, the label for TransTech, as well as some pricing. So TransTech um, active ingredient is Dinotefron. It's 70% active ingredient. And it comes in water soluble packets. There's 20 water soluble packets in a resealable bag shown here. Um, at a high rate, you can treat up to 100 dBH inches, a low rate of 340. You can apply it uh, through basal drench or soil injection or bark spray. You can foliar apply it, but as Emily mentioned with other foliar sprays, they just don't last. And so that's not how we recommend. 
some key features that are um, just for TransTech. It's the only Dynatefron that comes in water-soluble packets and also has 70% active ingredient. Other Dynatefrons are usually at 10 to 20%, so you would have to do a lot more mixing to get the same effectiveness of mixing um, a unit of TransTech. One packet can do five to 17 dBH inches. It's taken up into the leaf tissue fast, um, reports with, allness within 12 hours of um, getting control, but we usually say seven days. And it does have a large label, just like imidacoprid, which is Zytec, um, but it's much faster and it also can um, control armored scale, which is nice. So a lot of you might have already been using Dynatafron, um, TransTech for hemlock woolly adalgid and elongated scale. So your soft scales, hard scales, it does help to control emerald ash borer for a season and spotter and lantern fly. Compared to um, imidacoprid Zytec, it, which is also a systemic insecticide, it works a lot faster. So like I said, it's up into the leaf tissue with seven days or less and gives you a full season of protection. Um, Imidacoprid takes a lot longer, 60, 90 to 120 days to give you the same level of control. When you're looking to apply this, TransTech, you're really looking in early May through September. Um, if you were using a metacoprid, you would have to do this earlier uh, as long as the soil is not frozen. And really your cutoff point would be May for control. And then um, you could also do it in the fall months. One thing that is concerning is that these both are neonics and people are concerned about pollinators. So with using TransTech, it's really nice because you can wait till after flowering and then do the application. So pollinators are not a factor and you can get control for the spotter and lantern fly. There are different ways to apply TransTech. Um, the first one in the upper left-hand corner is with a soil injector, that's our HTI. You can also apply it by you using a basal trench uh, with creating a trench and either a bucket or using a drench kit. Um, and lastly, the favorite one is the basal trunk spray at the bottom. So doing a systemic basal bark spray with TransTech, you are going to use six to 12 packets of TransTech with one gallon of water. You're going to apply 1.5 to 2 fluid ounces per dBH inch. You're going to concentrate down in the root flare and go four to five feet in height all the way around the tree to the part to soak it to the point of runoff. And that one gallon will give you on label 65 to 85 dBH inches. I say target 75 inches. Um, the other application is through the soil injection. Again, with the HTI, you are going to inject uh, the insecticide around the trunk, um, hitting the cardinal points all the way around the root flare. And as you can see, this is where all the fibrous roots are. So it's really a good thing to make insecticide applications there for the tree to take it up. Or lastly, you can do the basal drench, um, mixing your product up, creating a shallow trench. You can even make little moats within the trench so that when you go to pour your um, insecticide around evenly the root flare, it doesn't go to one side and you get better distribution of your product. 
once it percolates the soil, you can replace the soil back in. And the reason that bark spray is preferred, it is something that I uh, definitely prefer when doing applications because it's simple, it's easy, um, and it's quick. And you actually use less product, therefore spending less money. And it's just as effective, if not more effective, because you're putting it right in um, to the bark of the tree. So the molecule in Dinotephrin TransTech is very small and penetrates even the thickest of barks. You do not need to use pencher bark. Um, you would just use a gallon of water with either six to 12 packs, water soluble packs of TransTech to do treatments. So it is simple and easy. Again, um, when doing applications, you want to make sure that the arc of the tree is not wet in the rain, uh, as well as early in the morning, if there is dew in the tree, the bark is wet, you have to wait till the bark is completely dry before doing applications. If you try to attempt this, it'll just dilute, um, could possibly potentially dilute and not give you the control that you're looking for. So um, using a three gallon, one gallon, sprayer, uh, manual sprayer, you're putting a gallon of water with either six to 12 packs, water soluble packs of TransTech in, going around, starting at the root flare, going up four to five feet and to the point of runoff treating the tree. Again, that one gallon of product um, mix will do anywhere from 65 to 85 dBH inches. So after two minutes, it is starting to dry and six minutes. And then by 10 minutes, your application is dry. We do say wait an hour before um, allowing children or um, animals around an area that you treated. So one thing to note um, is that the amount of sooty um, honeydew that is secreted by the spider and lanternfly and sooty mold, just because you did a chemical application does not disappear. This will uh, become less noticeable with new growth as well as um, with abundant amount of rain. And as Emily mentioned on hard surfaces, you could pressure wash or clean it off, but to let your clients know that it just does not disappear just because you did a chemical application. Uh, TransTech is the only dinotephron that has um, spotter and lanternfly on the label. We did get a, a special 24C um, label for Pennsylvania. We are actively seeking labels for Virginia and New York as well and should have them in the coming months. So pricing for basal trunk spray, as I said, TransTech, each container has 20 water soluble packets. A uh, packet uh, or a pouch of TransTech costs $326. And whether you're using six packs for treatment, um, it can cost $1.15 per inch to $3.01 per inch if you're using 12 packs per gallon and you're, you can treat with six inches, you can, I mean, six packets, you can treat 283 inches, 12 packets can treat 108 dBH inches. With the um, intense feeding that the spotter and lanternfly has on trees, it, it absolutely can um, cause a lot of stress and wounding on trees. And this might be okay with the tree of heaven, but when you're talking about your client's premier trees, their maples, willows, um, over 70 species, it is concerning. And going to the meetings for spotter and lanternfly, hearing homeowners that don't even have Alanthus on their properties, but 
might be in neighboring properties or close by and having their maples, oaks, their premier landscape trees affected by this is very concerning to them. So there is a lot of opportunities to um, manage their properties effectively and concerning when there's other unfavorable con conditions like drought, this can weaken the tree and make it more susceptible for insects and disease or maybe kill it outright. And we are seeing this with ambrosia beetle. Ambrosia beetle can um, create yellowing of the foliage. Entire branches can die and a characteristic of ambrosia beetle as indicated in the pictures here is that one to two inch long frass tubes um, that is um, made by ambrosia beetle. Bark sprays are the only thing that you can do to prevent trees from this attack. Maintaining the tree vigor can help. Ambrosia beetle's life cycle is 50 to 55 days um, and they can have two or more generations depending on the climate. The first treatment is at bud break. You're going to use either 10 guard, bifen, or upstar as a bark spray. And then you're going to repeat in the early summer for the second generation. Managing the tree health is essential and ideal for all trees, but especially when invasive pests like the spotted lanternfly is such a threat. Um, and there is a number of ways of managing tree health, as you probably all know, um, making sure that there is enough water, proper mulching. Uh, you can take soil samples to make sure the right nutrients are there. We do offer Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancement does offer um, a geogreen fertilizer as well as some diehard BioRush Plus and other products, uh, Cambostat, which is Paclobutrazol to help in tree stress. You can also use, as uh, shown here, um, air, an air spade to make sure girdling roots aren't an issue, but just keeping a tree in the best health possible is ideal. And just to review, TransTech does move quickly into the tree. It is 70% active ingredient and the only dinotephrin that comes in water soluble packets. The label does uh, reference the spotted lanternfly on it. It does treat a multitude of other pests, EAB, armored scale as well. Best way to um, treat for spotted lanternfly is doing a basal trunk spray. It does move fast, so even if uh, pollinators are concerned, you can do applications after flowers um, are no longer visible. And lastly, are there any questions? All right, thanks, Shannon. Uh, and unfortunately, we are past our scheduled time here. So uh, what we'll do with the questions that have come in, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll follow up with all the folks who uh, had questions during the webinar. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Emily and uh, Shannon for your presentations today. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for joining us as well. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to follow up um, with, either, uh, with either Emily or Shannon, or you can go to our website, treecarescience.com. Uh, for more information. Uh, we will be sending out um, the, uh, the recorded webinar uh, as well as the, uh, the um, uh, materials available to download uh, after this webinar as well. So look out for that email. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks everyone.